Welcome to the Lessons Learned Podcast, a podcast reflecting on the lessons we've learned and those we're still in the process of learning. I'm Komal, your host. I'm an interviewer, investor, and someone who has lived a lot of life in a short time. I built this podcast as a place for us to reflect, to be together, and to learn from one another. Let's get into it. Welcome to episode 18 of the Lessons Learned podcast. I guess it's also technically episode 5 because I recorded this episode back in October right after the Michelle Obama interview happened, the week following. But I did what I do, which is not quite ask permission uh, to use audio from the event. And once I had it up, I preemptively decided to take it down because it's just not good etiquette when you're working with people as significant as Michelle Obama to do so without uh, authorization. So instead, I decided then I was going to do a recap episode where I just walk you guys through the day, share my favorite questions and answers uh, from the conversation, and my takeaways from what that experience was like. And so that's what is on deck for this episode. When I think back to that day, one of the memories that sticks out most was the way that I first met Michelle Obama on the interview day. Now, when you are doing an event at this scale, you go through a dress rehearsal, but the guest is usually not in the house. So Michelle Obama did not do a dress rehearsal run through. But myself and the other individuals who were introducing the event from the Ottawa Board of Trade, etc., they were all with me at the dress rehearsal. So Kenya and I, my amazing friend Kenya, who's a documentary photographer and lawyer, we walk up to the stage and at this point we had been backstage in the green room and soaking it in and being as present as possible. And so we go out for our call time for the dress rehearsal and we walk through step by step how the intros were going to go when I would be coming on stage, when Michelle Obama would be coming on stage. Once my introduction was given, I would jump on stage. Then uh, the president of the Board of Trade would come up and introduce Michelle Obama. And I would be waiting for her on stage already. So we did the dress rehearsal. It was amazing. I asked, fake asked my first questions, which was a lot of fun to a stadium of 10,000 seats that was empty. It was so surreal to look out there and see no one but to be like, wow, this is this is about to happen. So fast forward a few hours and it's showtime. And for Michelle Obama, the Secret Service and her staff have her schedule down to the minute. So we had two minutes prior to me going on stage to interact with her and just say, hey, um, she likes to give her interviewers an opportunity to connect, to calm nerves if there are nerves. And so that's what we were there to do backstage. But they were a few minutes behind schedule, her team. And so I was starting to hear what we had gone through in the dress rehearsal happening on stage. They have a tight timeline because she was flying out to another event in Hamilton for the evening. So there were no delays. Part of the stadium wasn't filled because of traffic and they still started the show on time. And so... I am backstage with Kenya, and Kenya is about to meet Michelle, too, for the very first time. It's a moment that we had talked about. I promised her a few months earlier, um, she had put on Twitter when she found out Michelle Obama was going on tour in Canada, that she wanted to be the documentary photographer on the tour, um, or for the Toronto stop, and had put it on Twitter. (laughs) And I remember messaging her and being like, we're going to make this happen. It's just a matter of when. And so that moment was really important for both of us. But as I hear on stage, them starting to put our intro, my introduction, uh, starting to say it, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to meet her now. I don't want the event to be delayed or like, you know, this, the production to be behind. So I jet, I run around the stage to, to the side of the stage where the stairs are, just as they're calling my name and I walk on stage and I'm pumped. I have my book, I have my questions and then I take a seat. And for me, it was almost a good thing because I was just ready. I was ready for that interview. I was ready with all my questions. I was ready for our conversation. I knew what I wanted to hear from her. I knew what I wanted the audience to learn. I knew I just needed to hold space for her presence, her excellence, the incredible that is Michelle Obama. 
And so I was just ready to get into it. So as they're playing her intro video, the producer of the show comes up on stage and says, Mrs. Obama wants to meet you backstage. So I scamper off stage as stage is black and the video is running. And we finally get to meet. And it's like formalities because, you know, she's used to meeting moderators and them having nerves and, and you know, her needing to just help calm them down a little bit, us chit-chatting. But I was just so ready. And I remember us talking and saying, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm so excited. I'm really looking forward to this. And then after, you know, the initial banter, she's like, you good? And I was like, I am beyond ready. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so ready for us to do this on stage. And then as before we knew it, it was time to go up. And it was so incredible to not be waiting on stage for Michelle Obama, but to walk up together. And with such presence and knowing and groundedness, I did not have a nerve in my belly. I was ready. I wanted to share that story for two reasons. <laughs> the first being Kylie, who is working alongside Maddie, who is our editor and a producer on the show, suggested to me that it's awesome to open the show with a, a story of what I'm about to share about. And when I, we were talking through story ideas, that one was just so viscerally there for me. I just remember that moment of looking at her and being with her backstage and just being like, you know, I want to save my questions and our interactions for the stage because I know the impact that they're going to have for this audience. And that truly was the case. 8,000 people in that room. And it was just, I just rewatched the interview just to get myself in the headspace of this conversation today of recapping it. And I just started crying when I watched it. It's so wild how our minds can compartmentalize the good and the bad. It's like if it's too much in any way, it compartmentalizes it to protect us. But reliving it and seeing it again, I was able to be in awe of it once more. And I'm so deeply grateful for this opportunity and for how it unfolded and for the seeds it planted for me. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, how I got ready for the day, the interview itself, and share a little bit of what... Um, Michelle Obama shared with all of us, and then the aftermath. When I was preparing for the event itself, I had a lot in my arsenal to learn from. I have been through big events in the past. Um, my interview with Rupi Kaur here in Ottawa, I was both managing the logistics of that event and interviewing on stage. And I remember being on stage with Rocky, Rupi's manager, and her saying to me, Gomo, like, in the future, you don't need to be here for this period. Like you need to find people to support you on the event planning, event management. So you can focus on being the interviewer. So you can focus on your job because we were on stage figuring out how are we going to lay the flowers for Rupi's performance? And then we're like, what is logistically going down? And that was a really important moment for me because the more distracted I am from my actual job, which is how I make the audience feel and the space I hold for the guest who I'm interviewing, the more distracted I am for that, the less effective I am. So I had to get really focused for this event. And it was amazing because I didn't have to worry about logistics planning any of it. I was literally there to do one job. And that was to interview. So that was already off my list of things that I had learned from past events. The other thing I had learned, and when we're talking about building resilience, investigating resilience, I think, and even the concept of lessons learned, I was able to be, I will say this, my interview with Michelle Obama that day, the presence I had, I am so proud of. There's not a day in my life, literally, that I was more present for moment by moment. And what presence meant to me was calm, dialed in, taking in every moment with such mindfulness. And the only way I could do that was through the lessons I learned from other events where I learned the things I didn't want to happen. One of those things was major. And it was from my weddings. <laughs> so Mitch and I had 10 days of wedding events. Almost a thousand people at our weddings. We had a Canadian ceremony. We had a Punjabi, big, massive Punjabi wedding of many days long. And over that period of time, I became more and more sleep deprived to the point where on our actual wedding day, I couldn't sleep the night before. And I got like maybe two and a half, three hours of sleep. And somehow I also didn't drink coffee the day of the wedding. I don't drink caffeine at all, but I thought that day I really should have had some foresight to plan for an espresso or a Red Bull or something, even though 
I'm not, I don't partake in that otherwise, but I didn't. And so there was moments on the wedding day where I could just feel how tired I was and how it was checking me out from being able to take in certain moments. And it was still unbelievable. You know, I loved our weddings, but there are these moments or regrets that I had from that experience that I took to heart and that I applied to this experience so that I could be my best and take it in and not even just be my best, but so that I could really love the shit out of that day, (laughs) the biggest day of my career. I can genuinely say I loved the shit out of every single moment that day, in large part because I made myself go to bed, I think at like 11, I got a, I got seven hours of sleep and I felt totally ready to take on that day, well rested, well prepared. And so sleep was major, get rest before any major event, that's what helped me be more present. And then realizing that we have control over how present we are in a given day. A movie that Mitch and I love so much, it's called About Time. And it's with Rachel McAdams. And it's a beautiful love story where the main character has the ability to time travel and go back and relive moments in his relationship with his partner. And at the end of it, he just realizes that he would rather be present in a moment and live the moments that he would come back to, the moments that he would dream to relive again, than continuing to go back and have that surplus and not be able to really take in the novelty of that moment so for me it was like I want this to be a day I would always return to and that was the intention and that's what was achieved and now when it comes to nerves lots of people when I put in my dms I was going to do this episode asked me how'd you deal with your nerves on the day of and what I'll say to that is I didn't I didn't have nerves I had excitement The hardest part of the Michelle Obama interview was getting them to say yes, getting them to give me permission to take that seat. And once I acquired it, once they said yes, all my fears were gone. I just knew I was in my zone of genius. I was in my expertise. That knowing and that ability to be present and not be nervous have nothing in my mind about ego or who I'm supposed to be in this moment, or, you know, this is just about me this day. No, I got to be in service of that audience. I got to be in service of 8,000 people who paid between many different ranges to be in that room, to be inspired and uplifted by a woman who has transformed her and her husband, an entire generation of people. And that was my job that day. So if I was nervous, I would be doing a disservice to that opportunity because I, it was my job to be prepared. It was my job to own that stage. It was my job to create space for Mrs. Obama to share her wisdom with that room. And I just knew in my heart I was ready for it. And so nerves... There was moments where I felt a lot of like moving energy in my body and I had to like jump around backstage just to get it out (laughs) with Kenya and just like take moments to just like soak in the energy in my body before going on stage. But there was no doubt. There was none of that. And it comes from, again, the lessons I've learned. In 2019, I interviewed 42 people in the span of three months for the Thrive podcast. It was my way of putting myself through a mini boot camp for interviewing I knew that I could direct a conversation because an interview is a conversation and especially the kind of interview that that was going to be that day. It's not like I'm doing a hard hitting political interview or and even in those cases, like if you prepare enough, if you know enough about the person, the subject matter they're related to, you can just own the dialogue. It's like talking to a friend. It's like talking to someone you're meeting for the first time, a stranger who you're so curious about picking their brain. You can get rid of the pomp and circumstance and her being this icon and just come back and dial it into the human experience. And what would I want to know from someone who has lived this life experience? And what about her experience could I relate to and how can the audience relate to it? And fortunately, lots of people asked me as well how I prepared the questions. 
I had pitched her in December of 2018 to do that interview that took place in October 2019. So I had about 10 months in between. And I initially thought I was going to interview her in March of 2019 in Edmonton. And that didn't transpire. So what I ended up doing was I was technically preparing for that interview for 10 months. I read Becoming. And then I listened to the audiobook the week before interviewing her to just like remind myself of different pieces. And that led me to getting some even more amazing questions. And then I just remembered her, the interview that was done with her in Denver with Reese Witherspoon and the moments that really resonated with the audience and, and also that she became really connected to emotionally. And then I also thought of her interview in Edmonton with Robin Roberts and the same pieces, what resonated with the audience and what resonated with her. And so I pulled that data out and that's where the ideation around the questions came from. And then I have an incredible friend, Prasna Ranganathan, who is the lead for diversity and belonging or inclusion and belonging at Shopify. <laughs> and as soon as this happened, he was like, can I help you prepare questions? And I was like, absolutely. And within a few days, he had sent me a multiple page document with something like, dozens of questions and there was only likely we were going to get through 15 or 16 or 17 questions and I think we made it through like maybe 13 within an hour and so press sent me that document and what ended up happening was press wrote it in his language and I've never prepared for an interview that way so I was looking at his questions and I reorged them made them sound more like me but then the night before the interview I realized like that's not my process I, it's a very intuitive process for me so I actually scrapped those that version of questions and then rewrote them from scratch again the night before like I had gotten my nails done and it was a couple hours before bed and I was like I gotta redo these so that they feel really authentic to me and so I did and I have those pages written out in my in my work journal and it just like I was able to then memorize the questions because as I'm writing them and because it's the basis of what Presna wrote and he wrote that based on what I told him I wanted to interview her about specifically, it became this like very beautiful process where when I was sitting down with my questions that night, I started the baseline of memorization. And then as soon as I got up the next day and was getting hair and makeup done, I just kept reviewing the questions, reviewing them. And it's not just about haphazard questions. You have to think about the flow of a conversation. When we talk about, when we open, we open with more societally based questions. Like, for example, the first question was about it being International Day of the Girl Child the day before, or sorry, that day. And the post that Michelle Obama had put the day before asking people who valued you when you were growing up as a young girl. So I actually started the interview with that question to open it up and knowing that she loves talking about children, the impact children have had on her. And from there, I wove it into more questions about thoughts on things societally or systems um, issues, like not when you're in the room as the first, you're going to make sure you're not the only, like continuing the dialogue in that way. And then from there, going into romance and her and Barack Obama and how they met and the seeds of that relationship and how that love story is one that we are all so in love with. And then from there, going into her experiences around grief and mental health, and then we went and continued to go even deeper into her, the pressure around excellence and being so excellent in the world. And then we talked racism and we ended on thankfulness, thankfulness um, because it was Canadian Thanksgiving. And those weren't all the pre-prepped questions, but in one way or another, they are questions I had thought of prior to. And I actually didn't use notes during the interview. And I remember someone DMing me after. It was one of the girls that uh, I ended up buying tickets for because I wanted to make sure there was young women of color in the room. So I bought, I think it was 10 tickets and gifted them to a local organization, Ambitious, to um, distribute. And they went to an organization called Empowered M. Empowered M. And one of the girls messaged me and was like how did you do that without notes like that is insane and it's because of that memorization and then the conversation because I was so fully present like present to the point where as Michelle Obama was replying to a question I intentionally and I can viscerally like I'm right back there in my brain look around turned my head and looked at the stadium and took in the 8,000 people in front of me and then brought my attention back to Michelle and just soaked in that moment I cannot even express how 
it was like meditation in motion. That day was like meditation in motion. It was the most profound thing I've ever experienced. And in a big way, that presence, like that is what allowed me to have such a natural conversation with her. And that's what I hope to bring into all the tour stops on our Lessons Learned tour, North America tour, this April and May as well. Now here's an interesting story for you. So the day before the Michelle Obama interview, I am heavily invested in the cannabis market. And I did a, I got in on a friends and family round, which is one of the first investment rounds you can get in for a new startup with a friend of mine and his can med- medical marijuana company. And that company IPO'd in 2017. And it was right when I was on the beginning of my recovery. And so the returns from that investment have fueled my life for the last three years and given me the ability to take time off for my recovery, to invest in other women-led companies and other companies that I believe in. It's given me so much freedom in my life and so much ability to pay it forward. And the day before the Michelle Obama interview, news hit the sector hard that the the sales projections that a number of companies were making um, weren't going to be hit because store rollout, so storefronts across Canada, weren't rolling out as quickly as initially planned. And because the speculation in the market was so intense, um, that announcement and the shift in the company's trajectory in terms of their sales output ended up making my investment portfolio go down about 35%. (laughs) So literally the day before... (laughs) Michelle Obama, I did that interview, I lost a third of my net worth. And I was, it floored me. That was a really hard day. And that was such a juxtaposition. And if you've been following my story at all, back in the day, you know that, you know, highest highs and lowest lows. The week we got named to Oprah Super Soul 100 was the same week I was diagnosed with cancer. Being on my first magazine cover was the same week as my second surgery for cancer recovery. Um, Premiering at the Obama White House was my first pain-free day after my first surgery in 2016 um, after being diagnosed with cancer. So I'm used to highs and lows. (laughs) And so those highs and lows trained me, gave me the resilience I needed in this instance to not let that take me out because... It was a big loss and the sector is not yet stabilized, but it's starting to become on the rise again. But in that moment, I decided to compartmentalize and not in a way where where I wasn't going to give myself permission eventually to feel what I needed to feel, but I just knew in that moment that wasn't the number one priority. And so even in spite of me losing a third of my net worth, 24 hours before the biggest interview of my entire life, the biggest moment of my career, I showed up. I was present. I did everything I just explained to you. I was able to own that day because no one and nothing was going to take my joy away. I had worked so hard for that day. I had put in so much love, heart, effort joy into making that happen and so I had to decide it is literally the epitome of that kitschy (laughs) statement we always hear that you know you can't control what happens to you but you can control how you respond to it and in that moment I was in full control and that to me shows me how much I've grown and how much I've learned because we can't let the ups and downs of life deflate us we can't let the lows of life take the joy from the highs we have to know that they come hand in hand and that we can survive them and thrive through them and I wanted to share that anecdote and I wasn't ready to on the last time I recorded this episode back in October I just alluded to it because it actually set in motion so much for me it set in motion a lot of the important things that I had to grapple with and face post-interview. 
So I initially, at the beginning of this episode, said I'd do the pre, um, what it was like to prepare for the interview, and then we would talk about the interview itself, and then I'd talk about post, but I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to do what happened before, um, as, I, as I've already shared, and then I'm going to talk now about what happened after, and then we'll come back to the gems she shared. We'll end on the inspirational note. What I realized was I had a lot of limiting money beliefs, and that especially came back to am I worthy of earning money as me? I could invest in other people's companies and turn a profit on how hard they work and the ideas that they have. But after Dream Girl, it was really hard for me to own my own viability as someone who could make wealth and someone who was worthy of being paid uh, as a speaker, as a, a product myself, as now this interviewer. Um, Even with core space, I was harboring these limiting beliefs around wealth and financial abundance. And I don't just want to use like these woo-woo terms around it. So it's really what stories are we telling ourselves? What got ingrained in us as kids about money? And I'm talking this out and haven't had a lot of time to, or I have had a lot of time to reflect on it, but I haven't had a lot of time to verbalize it or opportunity to verbalize it. So this is me doing that. In my culture, mine is the first generation and my mom worked very hard and so did my aunt at the hospital. So the second generation of women who are in the workforce creating wealth for themselves. My parents were able to pay for my school, give me a great life and always prioritized education over work. I got a job in high school at the local hockey arena I sneakily got it. I didn't tell my parents I got it because I knew that they wouldn't let me work. But I wanted to make money for this trip that I could have gone on to Europe um, with my high school grade nine class. And I just really wanted to earn it myself because I didn't want to put that burden on my parents. And so I secretly got the job. And then, of course, they would find out because my brother played hockey. (laughs) So I knew it was going to come out eventually. But so when they did find out, they respected that I wanted to do that let me work until I was able to cover that in the last shift I had before um, the last shift I had before the trip where before for me to pay it off my dad picked me up and said you have to quit now education was that important and I did graduate as valedictorian in university I did well as a student I, I received an award at the university as well so education was a big focus but that also meant that I didn't fully get a sense of my own financial value Um, what I could earn, what I could make myself. And I started to internalize narratives that were were being told to me because after I got that job and during having that job, I worked exclusively on fundraising for the Canadian Breast Cancer Society, all of these different organizations. So I was very immersed in the nonprofit space. And there is something that embedded in me at that time that was like making money is a bad thing. And so when I fast forward to now, I look at the many beliefs that I hold or like the stories that I'm telling myself, and it's literally just programming in our brains um, that I had to undo. Because for me to go and step fully into this next chapter of my life, I have to release these beliefs because this tour, the stories that I'm here to help people share, the conversations that I can help people have, the platform that we can build is valuable. And it's not just valuable in a social impact lens, but in a financial viability lens for brands, companies that want to work with us and for products that we want to create for you as our audience. And so how that manifested in this past few months was me having to do some really deep work, Um, work around my financial beliefs, but then also work around my fear of what was next. So to wrap up the financial section, Having such a major loss happen the day before the Michelle Obama event, it was a juxtaposition that I chose to learn from. It was, in my opinion, an opportunity for me to see and say, wow, I was able to lean on this investment portfolio for the last few years of my life to get stable, grounded, and learn so much and reinvest in others. And now I can still lean on that investment portfolio, but I have an opportunity not to. I have the biggest event of my career that is proving to me my own value and worth. And I can choose to lean into that 
and I can choose to lean into starting to believe that I am a global brand, that I am someone who can have impact in a meaningful way that is also financially viable. And so that's the story I'm telling myself now. That's how I reclaimed that. That's how, that's how I've built resilience around that day itself because I can choose to put a reason and a meaning to what happened. And that's the reason and meaning I've chosen to align to what happened that day. So the other part of this is going all in on the tour. And that was a hard process because to go all in on this dream was major because what I realized was there was people asking me, what's next? What's next after this Michelle Obama interview? What are you going to do next? And how has your life changed because of what you did? What I came to realize was that interview was a moment in my career. It was a day. Yes, absolutely. It validated what I'm here to do in the world and it gave me confidence. Um, and I felt very competent in my skills and what I'm here to do as an interviewer, therefore giving me the confidence I have now. But that day didn't make a career. Now's the time for me to continue building my career and my, um, my credentials as an interviewer. And so how do I do that? I do it by going to the audiences that have been with me since day one, all of you, meeting you guys where you're at and interviewing the dopest people I can possibly connect with in each of those places alongside interviewing each of you. But the process, what happened to me post the Michelle Obama interview was actually kind of a bottoming out. It was like I had to hit another rock bottom. It was a high I didn't create enough space for me to celebrate and enjoy after because I was on a flight to New York the very next day. And as soon as I was leaving New York and coming back to Ottawa, I could feel that feeling in my gut. And so many of you guys know it. After a high, there's a low. And it was me starting to self-doubt, question, what do I do now? How can I even do things next? That actually didn't matter. I was diminishing the experience. All of the things. And so that happened for the next like four to five weeks because I had a big decision to make. So that volatility in my emotions was actually a reflection of the importance of the decision that was in front of me to make. And I finally made that decision. And Kim and I had the conversation right before Christmas that we're actually doing this. And fast forward another six weeks and we're actually doing this. <laughs> we're going to be going to six cities doing eight events, launching in February in Toronto with, with a beautiful event. And you guys are going to get to hear from me and other amazing humans cross industry about their lives, about what makes them who they are, about how they came back from the hardest parts of their lives, their stories of resilience and rising. And that seed was planted on that stage with Michelle Obama with the ultimate presence I was able to have that day. And it's a beautiful thing. But I wanted to share this episode because I didn't want you to think that it's like, wow, that was such a fun, amazing day. And yes, she was so present and she was so good at preparing and all these things. But after the high comes the low. It's a natural cycle of life. And it's what happens when we level up. We go through our turmoil. We find our way. We hit that inflection point of things feeling great. Doing the thing, building the project, getting the promotion. We get great at it. And then the next leveling up shows up and turmoil hits again. It's a natural cycle. And that is what builds resilience in us. And so I had to make it through that low to start building into my next high. And it's doing this for the last 10 years of my life that gave me the insights I needed for it to not take me out in a way that was really detrimental to my health and well-being. And I'm really proud of that. And my husband is just sneaking into my office now. <laughs> Hello, husband. <laughs> <laughs> he <laughs> hi hi so i asked mitch to sneak in here at some point during the interview and he found a perfect moment to sneak in <laughs> just to share a little bit as an audience member that day as the person who held my a uh completely objective audience a completely <laughs> objective audience <laughs> um who held my phone and went live for the audience to see on my instagram what was it like to see me interviewing Michelle Obama in front of 8,000 people? Oh boy. 
Hold on. First of all, you got to talk into the I, mic. I need to address the elephant in the room because I've seen her record many, many episodes, but she's just handed me the microphone and it Don't has it gonna... has it has this little protective uh, noise canceller on it that Einstein. that looks like a like a full size chinchilla. <laughs> <laughs> um as your partner, as someone who's known you for more than a decade, watching you on stage with Michelle Obama was awesome. Like it was it was it was completely astounding to see you like so comfortable on that stage. You went into that day in the week prior, you had so much energy and like excitement and fear and just turmoil inside of you about like, oh my God, this thing is happening. Like I, it, you were astounded that you had manifested this thing in your life and day of like, you just went straight into performance mode from the moment you opened your eyes that day, you were like game time and everything was perfect. Like the people you brought in to do hair and makeup and your prep and your question review and your question prep, like everything you're just, your brain was in the perfect space and I think like the thing that so many people commented after the fact was how calm you were on the stage and how by by being so present in what you were doing and being so deliberate with your energy with Michelle on stage it made it a lot easier for the audience to sort of take in the conversation and not you know, an energy that you chose not to put out there, which so many people, you see so many people have a really like big nervous energy when they're having the interview of their life, right? Like they get nervous, but because you felt so at home with her, it put the rest of us at ease that it made engaging in the conversation and just like taking it in so much more intimate and authentic. And, you know, like we didn't have to think about how you were feeling you were so you were so with her and you responded so like accurately to her energy you would hold space for the response you like time you know this is your journalism training coming into effect but also something that i think is very unique to you was your ability to just stay focused relaxed authentic your speech was like calm your questions were deliberate i feel like i'm ranting a little bit <laughs> <laughs> it was just it was it was really impressive it was like a reminder to anyone who wants to do something big that when it comes true it's like it's for a reason because you can do it and so seeing you do it i feel like was somehow inspiring for the rest of us just like yes like look at her she's so in it she's so calm she's just nailing it like it just it, it lifted us up and i don't know why that's the case but it was it was beautiful i was i was just in awe i was giddy right i may or may may not have recorded small snippets of it and was the like... whole thing <laughs> which is amazing because that's what i watched before yeah. recording this now. yeah so as you said i was like a little bit giddy at parts because when li okay, <clears throat> literally when i watched it before this i started crying because mitch's response is in the beginning like i can see hear him and see him and he flips the camera to my parents when she's talking about excellence and it being working class people who are excellent yeah. in what they do and how they live their lives and you turned it to my parents and i just like ah, just <laughs> cried. and it was so cool to see your dad so como's dad is like sort of uh on a, on like a notoriously rambunctious kid who turned into an incredibly successful businessman <laughs> but he still has this sort of like rambunctious energy and uh, he's not really one to like engage in any sort of personal development would be the wrong thing because it's Michelle Obama. But he was so present with the conversation and there was moments where I would turn to him and he was just like, I was I was surprised at how captivated he was because mm. he can have he can talk to anyone, but he was really, really like dialed in because he wanted to know. Mm. And you led that conversation and I could see like your dad being both proud in that moment but also completely in the conversation wow you know and for a parent when something like that happens i imagine because i'm not a parent yet or hope to be one day um but for a parent i imagine when something like that is happening for your kid you are just so absorbed by your kid you're like did they ask the question right like you know it would be so easy to focus on that and yet because you were so present 
your dad was able to engage in the conversation. I was just like, wow, like, I'm really getting a lot out of this. This is fascinating. I haven't thought about that. Or like, I really, really agree with that. Yeah. And it's also really, aw- what was really awesome too was another moment. I had gone, come off stage and she had said to me, you know, wow, I'm still going to have to process a lot of what we talked through because we went quite deep. We talked about grief, racism, so many things and her father's battle with MS and experience with MS. And I went back, I hugged her. She said that her team said, you know, Melissa, who I was in correspondence with was like, that was excellent. The Secret Service were smiling and like, you know, congratulating me. But then I was like, oh, my book is still on stage. So after they left, um, I went back on stage to grab my book and I just look in the audience and I see Mitch and my parents and I see their face and I have a picture on my wall of my dad and my mom at the Dream Girl premiere in New York and I'm, it's right, I'm pointing right at it. And that look on their faces, it was literally the most amazing thing to just be like, wow, they got to see their kid do the biggest thing in her career and they weren't going to come. You know, my parents weren't going to come. And then two days before, I was like, Mom, but like, I really need you there. I think it's important that you're there. And so they came. And even Ma, she was like, I am so happy I came. And my mom is a loving person, but she's not the most excitable or emotive. <laughs> but after that, like, she was so oh, happy. She was, she was hype. She <laughs> was like making friends with people in the audience. She was like gabbing with everyone. It was really cute. Yeah. It was beautiful. It was really beautiful. It was great. So last question for you before I'll jump back in is what was your favorite part of the interview? Because now I'm going to be talking to everyone about what I learned from the interview and some of Michelle Obama's responses to the very, like just her, she's amazing. And I just need you guys to hear some of how she's amazing because I didn't get to share that in the first episode that I recorded because I had to take it down, but segue us into it. My love, what did you, what was the section you loved? The thing that stood out most for me uh, was probably more of, I'm going to use a word you use, her ethos. Like something that that comes through in everything she expresses. Like the, her humanity. Everything she talks about comes from a place of doing the best you can with this life that you've been given. And there's something profound profoundly inspiring about that and it was really you know the thing that actually that I was I was a little bit surprised by was when you guys got into the grief side of thing um side of things she was a little bit taken back she was a little bit like she was emotional completely understandably because we were talking about something very intense um but to see her struggle with her words around that was like really humanizing. Because I don't know if she's been asked. Like, sure. I've never seen an interview where she, it, she was asked about mm-hmm. her best friend Suzanne and her father's passing. Yeah. And and also we just like we think people in positions of great exposure or power or profile kind of have it all together. And especially being, you know, first lady that she would have all the resources. But there's just it was really... Um, it was touching to see how much she was still on that journey Mm -hmm. and the fact that she was willing to speak about it, but also was like, you could see her. She almost like said, I've still got some processing to do. And that felt powerful. And yeah, I don't know. I, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you, my love for jumping in and rambling. In the most beautiful way, because for me, it gives me perspective, too, because it's hard recording something like this to, especially so many months later, to be like, am I beating a dead horse? Have I talked about this too much? But I also think for me, reflecting on it now and seeing how I will forever look at this interview as the thing that gave me the momentum I needed to go in whatever direction I'm heading in right now Mm -hmm. and whatever I'm building right now. Absolutely. And so having the love of my life reflect to me some of the things he took away from that day is very wonderful. Now he's going to go make some vegan samosas (laughs) for his colleagues for snack day. What is it called? Snack and social. (laughs) And now I'm back. So I want to end today's episode um, with a section about the interview itself. So you may not have anticipated, you know, I didn't anticipate to get quite so intense in that last segment before Mitch jumped on 
but really like the things I've learned since taking that stage holy shit like I feel like I've learned more in the last 10 months <laughs> about myself who I am what I'm here to do than ever before in my life like I feel so rooted in myself and I will always remember this interview as a big reason as to why that is so let's get into some of Michelle Obama's incredible wisdom and we might as well start with her conversation around grief it's been a hard week for many of us um there's been some major losses both in the social impact world and in the sporting world uh Layla Jana who is the founder of Samasource, passed away from epithelioid sarcoma, which is a type of cancer. Um, it was really surreal for me to read about it because when she was first diagnosed, I sent her a message just in solidarity as a cancer survivor myself. We both had sarcomas. And it's one of those things that always makes me wonder again, like, she's gone and I'm here. And I didn't know her well at all. I We'd never met but she inspired me so much in my journey and it's still, she's gone and I'm here. And that is something that Michelle Obama talked about in relation to her friend, Suzanne. So one of her best friends was diagnosed with breast cancer and passed away very suddenly. And her father passed away from MS later in his life. So she talked about how important it was to experience the loss and let it come in. That's what she learned, she said. And she said she was grateful that she had a mother that let them do that. Someone as well who didn't let them ruminate all too much, reminding them that their dad wouldn't want them to do that. And then she also said, it takes time. And she said, I mean, I can barely talk about it today. She said, it stays with you. But for me, it's continuing to uphold a life that would make the people that I lost feel proud. She said, it stays with you. And that for her, it's continuing to uphold a life that would make the people that she lost feel proud. Those sentiments, continuing to uphold a life that those we've lost would feel proud of, is one that will stay with me forever. There's so many people who I've lost that I can wonder, they're gone, but I'm here. One of my friends, Heather, from university had a skin cancer as well. She was diagnosed the same year as me, and she passed away, and I didn't. And so I asked that question about grief because I've experienced a lot of loss and grief in my life. And I wondered for this person, this woman, who has been through so much in the public light, so much in her life, how did these major losses impact her as a grown person, and how did she reconcile that grief? And it was such a beautiful reminder and conversation and so powerful to see her share so candidly and powerfully about that, that experience in her life. Whew, you guys, I'm not going to lie. I'm feeling emotionally hungover in this moment, <laughs> especially because reflecting on a lot of what we talked about, it was big stuff. And um, I just wish I could share the audio with you so you could just hear it from her firsthand, but I'm going to do my best to continue to synthesize some of her responses. So I asked her about excellence, and I asked because often we hear these conversations about ambition and having too much ambition and, and working too hard and all of these things, but when you look at the Obamas and what they did and her commitment to fitness and well-being, to her role, um, their careers, her as a mother, there is a level of excellence, there's a standard that she has, and I could feel it even with her team, there's an expectation for excellence. And so I asked her, how did you unabashedly pursue your excellence? How did you do that in the world? And I'm not as eloquent right now as I was on stage, but what she shared was, for me, it was realizing that I was probably trying to show up for my parents in a way that made them proud, because I understood the sacrifices that they made very early on. Not because they put it in our faces, but I had eyes to see. You know, I saw my father get up every day and struggle with an illness that slowly took his ability to walk away, but never complain. You know, so when you grow up with a father with a disability who is working every day to pay the rent, to pay the bills, and send you to college, and he's not thinking about his joy and his happiness, he's getting up every day being excellent. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like excellence 
we see it as somebody on TV, somebody with money, somebody with prestige. I saw excellence every day in my working class father who got up and was a decent man and got up every day and treated others with respect. He embodied excellence. We just don't celebrate that. So, you know, I look around and I was surrounded by excellence. It was working class excellence, but it was excellence nonetheless. Can we just, (laughs) yes, to every immigrant kid, kid who had parents who just worked so hard, can we just put up the praise hand emoji? (laughs) When she said that, Mitch turned the camera to my dad in the video, and that caught me off guard when I was watching it again today. Because it is, it's that working class excellence. It's, it is, it's that working class excellence It's what our parents were willing to do for us every single day with no, no celebration, no pomp and circumstance, but they just did it for us for a better life. So yes, that is also why I have chosen excellence as my word for this year as a value that I have on a sticky note on my computer in front of me as my core value. And I so appreciated that response from her. Next, I want to share a segment that we did on fitness because it's something that's really important to, she did the Let's Move initiative for kids, which I think that's the right name, but forgive me if it's not. And what was really cool about her conversation around fitness, and she talked about how women are the stewards of fitness in our homes and our communities, and that that's something she wants to commit more time to now that she's out of office, uh, or now that Barack's out of office and they're out of the White House. And something that she also shared, which I wanted to her to hit on, was her uh, friend trips to Camp David, where she would have the Navy SEALs or the Marines do three day, three time a day workouts with them, including running up and down a hill called Big Bertha, <laughs> and that her friends protested because she had also banned alcohol and and like junk food, and so she was like, because that's who I was at the time. I was that, you know, I was that intense. Um, but then eventually the wine came back and more friends started showing up again, but, uh, it was a really, really wonderful story and hilarious. And the whole, whole audience was, was just in stitches. What was really wonderful about that fitness conversation is a conversation I had last week at the Founders Fund interview that I did, where you, we shared that on the podcast last week, but there was a founder there by the name of Vanessa, the founder of Gift Better Company. And she shared with me a story about her grandmother. So Vanessa, her grandmother, her mom, others, I believe, were at the event. And it was Michelle Obama's conversation around fitness that finally convinced Vanessa's grandmother to reevaluate her health and well-being. And Vanessa said it's something that they were trying to encourage her to do before then. She's a very independent woman living alone, a number of things. But it was that conversation and and her grandma walking away from it. And she was like, I need to make things right. I need to fix things and I need to take, take things more seriously. And I thought, whoa, like that, that is so cool. (laughs) And I, as you guys know, like fitness has been a big part of my journey in building my own resilience and coming through my recoveries, movement, well-being. Um, And so to hear that, I asked that question out of my own curiosity, but also so that we could have a dialogue around movement and fitness and how individualized it can be and, and how it is just whatever each individual needs it to be, but that we can all benefit from moving in whatever way we can or mindfulness if, if mobility isn't an option for you. Um, there's so much we can do for ourselves. And so that was a really dope anecdote slash story that I got to hear. And what made me think more was like there was 8,000 people in that room. So the number of ripples from our conversation is so amazing to think about. So I'm going to share two more little anecdotes from the interview. So I'm going to quickly do two in one. And these aren't meant to be quick. Like this was an hour and 10 minute conversation, but this is a long podcast now. So I'm going to be as brief as I can be. So I intentionally started as I shared asking her about International Day of the Girl Child. And so she ended up sharing because something that I read about was that she believed in having multiple touch points with the groups of kids, many of the groups of kids that they were meeting. And she did that because she said in the beginning, they don't believe you. They think you're there just for a photo op. They're still seeing you in the shininess of what you are, and the kids don't actually think you care about them. 
But she said after two, three times, the kids actually let their guard down and you can have meaningful and real and raw conversations with them and let them know that they're capable of being in that White House, that they belong there, that, you know, she said, I wanted these kids to feel as welcome in these hallowed halls as senators and individuals, uh, ambassadors, people who were roaming those halls as their own. She said, I I wanted those kids to feel just as at home in those hallowed halls as the others. thought that was so impactful. And so one story that she shared was um, about a group of Indigenous youth who they had met on reserve. And, you know, after spending a day with them, her and Barack decided to invite them to the White House. And so they came to the White House. They got to meet with Secret Service, meet staff. um, And then... Michelle and Barack Obama, they took them to a pizza place in downtown D.C. with the motorcade and everything. And then it was time to wrap things up. And this young woman came up to Michelle and and Barack and said, you saved my life today. She was contemplating suicide and that trip saved her life. And at that point, it was the second question and she began to get emotional. And we all began to get emotional because, wow. And she said, that's why. Like, that is why. It is so important for me. She's like, if there's a child in my vicinity, like, I do anything I can to make sure that they feel seen because you never know the impact you're going to have on someone's life. So that was another amazing drop. And then we talked about race and racism. And in the book, she talked about how she realized that her and President Obama being in the White House, I'm going back and forth with saying Michelle, Mrs. Obama, President Obama and Barack. So uh, I apologize. (laughs) Forgive me. Um, There's no consistency in that. But um, she talked about race and racism. And I asked her how in the book, she said that their mere presence in the White House was a provocation. And that language really stuck out to me. And it was something I asked her about how do you reconcile that racism? And what she shared was her parents always taught her about context. And what she meant by that was contextualizing the person in front of you, the person who's being racist, and thinking about her grandparents or great-grandparents and segregation and and the Jim Crow era, and thinking about how that means that that person's grandparents grew up in a segregated America as well on the other side of things. And they are actually terrified to see us in this White House. And she said it not as a joke or not as something to laugh at, but sincerely, this is some people's biggest fears. So she said contextualizing those those people who feel this way, who, who harbor that racism, that resentment, but then also knowing who you are. She said, I know who I am. I know I work hard. I know I am excellent. I know who I am. And she said rooting in that helped her move through it so much and helped her get through so many of the media calling her so many vitriolic things. Um before she became the most loved, you know, woman. And she was very candid about it. And she said, the reason I am this honest about it is because I don't want young kids coming up who are experiencing racism and experiencing these hard things to think that it wasn't hard for me. No, this was hard. This was not an easy ascent. She's like, that's why I'm so candid about this. And that is also why I decided I really wanted to ask her that question. And what really resonated in her response was this. Goodness knows no race, she said. It knows no income. You know, I know a whole lot of, you know, I'm sorry, wealthy white men (laughs) and the whole audience roars in laughter um, because we know what she means. It's there are a lot of wealthy white men who aren't great humans. And then she says, that's what I'd say. Going high. Going high doesn't mean you ignore the pain. That you don't acknowledge the pain. Going high means that you don't react with your visceral, guttural, short-term response, which never helps. You know, going low is selfish. Going low is not long-term. It's like road rage, you know? You do it and you're like, "Mm, that was stupid, right? And going high is about the long-term. And especially if you're in the White House, if you're the commander-in-chief, if you're married to that person, you have a responsibility to go high and to think broad and think strategically at all times because every word you utter can change the face of so many lives. That's what I mean by going high. But it doesn't mean you ignore the pain but that doesn't mean you overlook the hurt because a lot of kids like us who go through it, we have to talk about it because if we don't want it to break us, the slights that we feel every day, 
side looks and glances, the judgment, the low bars that are set for us, it's like we have to call it out. We have to label it and point it out. And I don't want any kid thinking that going high means you just suck it up. And I don't want any perpetrators to think that the words that they utter don't do damage. People have to own what they say. And if we continue to ignore it, you know, then they would never own it. That's why I talk about it. That's why I talk about it plain and clear and simple. Finally, it was so poignant how she shared that. And I had in my heart the young women uh, who I invited to the room and so many of us who were people of color in the room. And it was actually a family friend who was there who shared, and, and she is a white woman, and she shared that that was the most impactful part of the conversation for her. And I knew in this predominantly white room the impact that could be had with a very open and honest dialogue about race. And that was really cool to be able to help hold space for that and to have her share such amazing truths with us and be so honest. So finally... The last question I asked question the last question I asked her was about thankfulness because it was Canadian Thanksgiving at the time and so I just asked for so I just asked her what are you most thankful for in your life right now? She said her health. She said that she wakes up every day and can move her legs and the audience like it we all felt it in our hearts cuz she was referring to her father at that point and her girls and the goodness of people who, millions of people around the world who prayed for them every day to be well. And then she shared what I think is the perfect thing for us to end on today. She said, but I have traveled the world and people are waking up every day doing the right thing, trying to live with a level of kindness and goodness, trying to live by the values that they were raised in. Because we were all raised with those values. The reason people connect to that little girl, Michelle Robinson, that I write about in my book is because we were all her, men, women. I don't care where you were. We were raised around a dinner table with hardworking parents trying to make sure that they did better by this. And we carry that with us. Yeah, there are some people who harbor fears for whatever reason, but their fears are even understandable in their context. We just have to be more vulnerable to each other. Because what I did by sharing my story did the opposite of what most people think. It's like, don't tell people about yourself. Just keep it all in because maybe they'll judge you. They won't like you. Well, here's the thing. When you are vulnerable enough to open yourself up, wow. People are more likely to do that themselves. And then we see each other. Now, we're not just objects. We're not just colors. We're not just jobs. We are real people with stories and insights. And as I say in the book, it's harder to hate up close. So we have to let each other in and take the risk that sometimes we might get hurt and disappointed. But more often than not, we will be rewarded. People will open up. So that's what I'm grateful for on this Thanksgiving. And I hope you all do what you need to to know your story and share it. Open up. Don't be afraid of judgment. Just be ready to welcome the acceptance that will come. And we will do better as a world if we can do that a little bit more. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. The complete validation, I think, for many of us to continue sharing our stories. And the validation I felt in the moment when I asked her 10 months earlier to interview her in Edmonton and when she grabbed my hands and said, this is destiny. The courage I had to share my story with her in that moment enabled this experience to come to life and I just want you all to know that whatever you are here to do or share you are destined for and the harder life gets the harder the things that you walk through are the more resilient and capable you become to rise and continue becoming who you are destined to be. It's taken a lot for me to finally record this recap episode, and I think I know why now. That day changed my life. That opportunity changed my life. And I'm putting in the work now to make sure 
that I do justice to what that opportunity was for me. And that we continue to have conversations like this and that we continue to share our stories with one another and that we continue to elevate through our shared experiences by seeing one another, by validating one another, and by knowing one another. I thank you from the bottom of my heart if you've stuck through this whole episode for listening, for taking it in, for allowing me to share these lessons that I learned from interviewing Michelle Obama and everything that went into that day. I love you. Until next time. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you loved this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to follow me, Komal, check me out on Instagram at K-O-M-A-L-M-I-N-H-A-S or the show at Lessons Learned Podcast underscore. And if you have an idea of a lesson that we should dive into on the show, then slide into our DMs and submit there or on the website along with any guests you think I should interview and talk all of the things with. As always, I hope that you make some time for you this week and reflect on the lessons you're learning or have learned and take some time to celebrate all the incredible that is you. Until next time, guys. Bye.